Ten years ago, I came back to Sweden from a visit to China and to India, and I wrote an article about the problem that I had on this trip. The problem of making it possible to sit at a Starbucks, sipping a cappuccino, reading The Economist, because that was impossible in both countries, but for different reasons. In China, there were Starbucks cafes. Uh, the economy had begun to open up uh, to a considerable extent, but the political situation had not. So The Economist was banned. It was impossible for me to read it at the same time. In India, I could read The Economist or basically anything, because an open political system with free speech made that possible. But I couldn't do it in a Starbucks because of the extent of regulation, import barriers, and uh, license requirements that made it impossible for Starbucks to operate in India. And I asked the question in that article, where will it be possible for me to do both things at first, uh, for the first time? Um, will it be that the political openness in India will be followed by economic openness, or will it be the economic openness of China resulting in political openness? Well, the results are in. Recently, when I visited India for this documentary, I could sit in a Starbucks, one of many Starbucks now. They expand aggressively in India right now. And I could drink a cappuccino. That's one of many reasons why India is very interesting to me. This combination of democracy and, and economic freedom. Now, there's been a lot of hype recently about the new Indian-born CEO of Google, who now joined the ranks of other Indian-born CEOs in businesses like Microsoft and Nokia. They suddenly seem to run Silicon Valley. And that's one aspect of this story, but it also, in a way, just makes us recall that old saying. A parliamentarian who asked the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, why is it that Indians seem to succeed everywhere except in their own country, India? Why is that? The moment they go abroad to a more business-friendly place, to a more open economy, they do incredibly well. Why does that not happen in India? Well, we know why, because the, Indian, the new Indian government after independence inherited a system of hierarchy and control from the British, and they uh, made it even more suffocating when it came to the economy in many ways. The old British Raj, who told people what to do and when to do it, was replaced by a licensed Raj, who told everybody what to produce, when to produce it, in what quantity, at what price, and what they could and couldn't do. It became one of the worst countries in the world to do business, to trade, to resolve court cases. Despite the political openness, the free speech, the open debate, it seemed to be impossible to have the same kind of experiments and innovation when it came to the economy. And everywhere, as a result, we had bureaucrats and policemen taking bribes. Because when you're in the hands of the bureaucrat, they also can extend a hand and demand for a bribe for you to do anything, basically. So for decades, we talked about the Hindu rate of growth which was supposedly a, a growth rate that's lower than the uh, growth rate of the population. So basically, Indians got poorer and uh, found it impossible to really make a living. And yet, the Indian population during all these years were incredibly inventive and hardworking, and they had to be just to get by. As Gurcharan Das, who is uh, one of the experts in, interviewed in this uh, film, puts it, the economy in India grows at night, because that is when the government sleeps. Now, the question we pose in this documentary is, what happens when the government begins to take a nap once in a while during daytime as well? That's what the show is about, because the old system began to crumble in 1991. After decades of stagnation, half the population living in extreme poverty. India ended up in a severe crisis, and foreign exchange reserves had been reduced to such a point that India could barely finance three weeks' worth of imports. At that point, the system was falling apart, and the government began to reform the economy. Um, they abolished many of the regulations, many of the license requirements, reduced many of the import uh, tariffs, and more people got more freedoms in India. And the result already is impressive. The Hindu rate of growth, it turned out, wasn't very Hindu at all. It was just a result of stopping Hindus and other Indians from um, experimenting, innovating, starting businesses, expanding their businesses and trading with the rest of the world. Since 1991, the average growth rate of the Indian incomes has been 7.5% a year. 
At that rate, you double average incomes every 10 years. According to the World Bank, 140 million people were raised out of poverty in just the three last years. 140 million people in three years. And many are approaching a middle class lifestyle. The reforms are still very patchy. The speed is slow. This has not happened everywhere, not in all sectors, not at all. But there are now new openings and people who rapidly exploit those openings when that happens. As the great philosopher Leonard Cohen puts it, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. You can tell the Indian story from different angles. You could talk about the IT service industry, the Infosys, the Vipros, the Tata services companies. You can talk about Ford's 400-acre factory in Gujarat or Foxconn, who now plans to invest in some half a dozen, a dozen mega factories in India. But the angle we chose for this film is another one which we also think tell this story in an important way. And that's more of the grassroots capitalism. Those, all those individuals, all those millions of Indians with energy and entrepreneurial talent who get used for that talent only now when the system really begins to open up. Like the 25 million street vendors who were not legally recognized as formal business owners until a few years ago and therefore could be harassed, stopped, blocked, they couldn't get ca attract capital, they could never expand, they couldn't build real stores and so on. I'll mention two of those stories, expand a little bit on two of these stories because I think they're important in their own right, but also, and also because there are a few excellent recent Cato papers on, on, uh, that gives you a background to these stories if you are interested in following them up. And they, those papers are out there as well. One of them is Madhusudan Rao, who is a Dalit, uh, once considered untouchables, uh, on the lowest rung of the caste system. Uh, you couldn't even touch them. Worked in the dirtiest, most dangerous jobs in agriculture, in sanitation, and so on. The social transformation that begins to occur when we have urbanization, when we have markets, when we have uh, competition, might have the biggest and most important um, effect in, for people like that. When people are more interested in cities, in markets, in what you can do, and at what price, rather than your family background or your caste. Madhusudan Rao, he moved into the city because he thought that that would give him the big, greatest opportunity of getting a real job, something that could help him give his family a comfortable life, his parents a comfortable life. And what he did was that he moved to Hyderabad. And he did this in a, at a moment when telecommunications industries began to expand and really explode. And he had a knows for business. And at some point, he overheard a contractor scolding an employee for not providing enough with workers to dig trenches for telephone cables. And he thought, here's an opportunity. Here's one of those cracks in the system when I can step in. And what he did was that he said, look, I can give you at least 25 workers who could do this until 10 o'clock tonight. And the contractor got interested and gave him a chance. So he went to his sister, borrowed the money she could uh, uh, lend him. So he rented a truck, got back into the rural areas, and uh, talked to men that he knew, that he knew could do a hard work at a, in, in, um, immediately. And he came back with some 40 workers, and they did it all in a short period. The contractor was overjoyed. The workers were paid straight away. And Madhusudan himself made more money in one day than he had seen in his whole life until then. So he got more jobs like that to connect people, to get those workers uh, into the right places. Started several businesses doing this, and in the end formed a construction company and he now employs 350 workers on an ongoing basis. And one of the points is that he hires them regardless of caste, because when you've had problems uh, doing that, when you have been discriminated against, working with prices, with wages, being able to compete with a price mechanism is a powerful weapon, because then you can do the same work 
cheaper than others can. And when you're in the city, when the price mechanism is the important thing, then you suddenly you don't care much about the family background, about the cost, only what you can do. So he's now one of India's most recent millionaires. He's been able to give his parents and his wife's parents back in the village a comfortable life. And he has also moved into a housing complex of uh, a lot of well-to-do people. Uh, you saw him saying that he was proud of doing this without even getting a loan. Well, one of the reasons was that he was a visitor there and they didn't know about his family background. He overheard someone saying that it's a good thing that only upper caste people lives here. And then he thought, I'll show them. So he just worked a bit harder, got more money, bought an apartment there without a loan, and now he has accomplished another of his goals in his lives. So basically, Indians are starting to succeed in India as well. That's what the story tells you. And also, and even more important, it beats some of the traditions, some of the um, uh, old cultural chains that the caste system and other traditions imposed on people. The price mechanism turns out to be stronger than the caste system when they are in open competition. And there is a paper here by Shwaminathan Ayar, a capitalism's assault on the Indian caste system, which records this development on a larger scale as well, looks at the living standards of especially Dalits and how that has changed, especially since 1991, how they are beginning to start businesses, how they are beginning to make a better life, how they are beginning to move into new sectors, into new areas that, where they weren't welcome before. Deep in the hills, within the forests, live the tribal people who are not even formally a, a part of the caste system. We look at some of the tribal people who have farmed their lands for ages, but never had a formal title to the land. The British thought that they owned it and just stole their land, stole their, um, their trees. And when we had the Indian independence, the forest department and the government thought that they owned that land and didn't formally recognize the ownership of those who had tended the land for ages. They weren't even allowed to build wells or irrigation system on the land. And they had no economic incentive to do this because if they did, the moment they got their farms, their agri agriculture to work, well, someone else could step in and confiscate uh, the land. They could uproot the crops, which was, of course, a breeding ground for corruption because then the police just stepped in and said, or the uh, government authorities stepped in and said, if you don't pay us, we'll take this from you. So they had to think short term, not because of cultural reasons, not because of ancient traditions, because they didn't have a safe property right in their own land. They had to take what they could briefly because they didn't know about what could happen tomorrow. So they, the lands were often depleted. They often cut down the forests if they could make a living in the short period because of that. Ramabai, as we saw, was considered a thief for tending the land that he owned. But with the changes, with the economic reforms, they began to step up and talk about their rights as well. And in 2006, we got a new Forest Rights Act, which said that if you could prove that you farmed this land, if you informally owned this land before, 2000 and at the end, before the end of 2005, you will get a legal title to the land. The villages were overjoyed. They were delighted and thought that this would change their lives. The problem, though, is that it's difficult to prove something like that. There's no land registry. There's no formal um, uh, registration of the land that you farm. So only 10% of the claims to new titles were approved of in the places where, that we looked at. But then they got an idea. What about using new communications devices, new technologies to, um, to try to prove our claims? They use satellite imagery. They used Google Maps, archival satellite maps that could prove that this land was farmed before 2006. And then to show which section of this land was held by a specific, a specific individual or a specific family, they used handheld GPSs and walked along the land and showed this and superimposed this on the satellite imagery and returned those maps from the village to the um, government authorities. And not just 10% of the claims, but 90% of the claims were then approved of. And as a result, many of them now own 
even formally the land that they always owned in an informal way. So they can begin to build wells, they can invest in better crops, they can invest in irrigation, safe in the assurance that they will own the result and reap the rewards of those long-term long investments in the future. And lands entirely depleted under the Forest Department is now being regenerated in a lot of places around India. There's a paper on this, an innovative approach to land registration in the developing world that you can pick up on your way out of here as well by Peter and Clayton Schaefer that uh, looks at this process, how new technologies and the intersection between new technologies, uh, new uh, ownership rules and civil society groups, how they now make property rights a reality for more people in India and other emerging economies. So there are success stories and we like to present them because it shows you what is possible. It tells the world the, about the potential that was there all along in India. But India still has a very long way to go, as Ian pointed out here in the beginning. Plenty of regulations are still in place. The labor market is very regulated. The courts are closed. The government of uh, Prime Minister Modi is making all the right noises about being more business friendly, opening up opportunities for ordinary people to engage in, in business and entrepreneurship and trade. They have set the goal of, goal of being at least one of the 50 best places in the world of doing business, according to the World Bank Doing Business um, Index. And that's a great goal. It would be a tremendous achievement if that happened. But presently, India is at place 142 out of 189 countries. So there is a long way to go before they're even in the best half the countries in the world. And it gets much worse if we look at a few specifics that are important for businesses if they are to expand. When it comes to approving construction permits, India is the 184th country out of 189. When it comes to enforcing contracts, it's 186 out of 189 countries. So that goes to show why India succeeds when it comes to the different service sectors. IT services, yes, you don't have to build large, huge factory complexes. You don't have to have access to ports and very smooth uh, movements of, of big goods to new cities and to other parts of the world. But if you want to unleash the manufacturing industry, if you want to open up the farming sector as well, then you need to deal with those micro-reforms as well. One million youngsters join the labor force every month, and they can't all work at IT service industries in the big cities in India. They're also often unskilled, and they need something else. If you look at the Fraser Institute's Economic Freedom of the uh, World Indexes, you can see tremendous forward movement when it comes to India. In 1975, India scored only 4.5 out of 10 in the index, where 10 is the most economically free. Now it's 6.5, and that's a big change. That's like going from where Zimbabwe is today to where Vietnam or Thailand is today. And that's a great achievement in itself. But it still only makes India 110 out of 100, 152 countries. So a lot of things have been done, and that's why we can see these achievements. When there are cracks in the system, the light gets in, people can start to do things. But we need more cracks, and the whole, um, the whole all those barriers to businesses, to trade, to the human achievements in business and culture must come down as well. India is waking up. That's, the, that's our story. India awakes. But just waking up, having a decent co coffee and making a to-do list is not enough. You also, that's just the start of the day, right? Then you have to look at that to-do list and begin to tick the boxes and really accomplish things. So it's a hopeful message about the potential that's there what goes on, but more has got to be done. It's morning in India, but as you all know, that's when the workday is about to begin. <laughs>